I'd like to provide a video of a presentation I made back in June of 2013 at a conference on business forecasting in Chicago. The subject matter is sales and operations planning framework. Uh, first, a little bit about my company, which I'm actually doing this for educational purposes at this point, but my consulting company is CR Supply Chain Consulting. And what we look at is, uh, according to the graphic here, we use metrics, lean, and business processes to achieve sustainable improvements for our clients. Uh, a warning, a caveat emptor, if you will, buyer beware. This presentation, of course, is based on my background. I worked for high volume consumer packaged goods companies such as Colgate, Palmolive, and Newell Rubber Made Office Products for many years. So my background is based on that perspective. I'm also a mathematician, statistician, industrial engineer. When it comes to uh, psychology and philosophy, I'm more of an armchair uh, devotee. And I absolutely hate slob, which actually stands for slow and obsolete inventory. Uh, don't worry, you're in good hands. Uh, you know, I've read the book, so I can guide you in this small, short presentation. Here's the agenda of what we want to do. We're going to present a framework for sales and operations planning and talk about the phases of sales and operations planning. You're not an expert at it when you first start it. And the SNOP journey, and then the commitment required by the company if you're trying to do something like implement sales and operations planning. So what's a framework? It's a structural plan or basis of a project. Uh, it's also a structure or frame supporting or containing something. You make a framework for a house, you make a framework for many business activities that you're trying to do. So what we're trying to do is what's the structural plan or basis for this project implementing sales and operations planning. So what is sales and operations planning? What is the goals of SNOP? It's about the proactive balancing of demand and supply. Uh, forecasting is trying to predict demand and obviously the supply function is to try to make the products that are you forecasted that you're going to sell and have them in the right place in the right time. So trying to get that balance of the two. Uh, we're trying to get to one number. We want to have one business plan that we go after. So this requires being, being collaborative with the other people that are making plans of what they think the business is going to sell. That includes sales, marketing, operations, general management, and certainly finance and accounting. Something that I say all the time, and my students in operations management are used to hearing me say, is the best plan, and really the goal of operations, is to have the right products in the right place, in the right quantities, in the right quality, at the right time, in order to maximize revenues, which means meet your sales goals, maximize service to therefore deliver everything that customers orders to them on time, and to minimize the inventory necessary to do the above two. Oh yes, and of course, we want to do all of that at a minimum cost. And we want to have the most efficient, effective, and strategic management of capacity possible. SNOP, Sales and Operations Planning, impacts the customer service supply chain. This is a model that I've used. It's not that different than other people's models for uh, how uh, a fulfillment chain works or a supply chain management chain works. There are two different aspects of it. We take orders and we manufacture or have the goods manufactured for us. Again, I'm reminding you that my background is CPG, consumer packaged goods companies. So my background is kind of biased towards that. The trade, think Walmart, Target, car for whoever it may be, places an order. The order is processed to make sure that all the items ordered are legal and things that we actually sell. With modern ERP systems, they are going to be okay because your system probably won't allow people to order things that are not valid for the current month or time period and that they are authorized to order. 
Also, you do a credit check. If the company that's ordering owes you more money than you think is viable, you're probably going to hold their order till they make a payment. The order is then released to the warehouse. The warehouse goes and picks the order, stages it, loads it into a truck, and distributes it to the directly to the stores or the distribution center of your trade customer. Now, how do products get into the warehouse? Well, you start with some manufacturing planning. What are we going to make today? What are we going to make tomorrow? What are we going to make this week, this month? Maybe even the next three months, depending on how long your supply chain order cycle is. You release that plan to purchasing so they can tell their purchasing suppliers how much goods to prepare for and what they what to see coming on the horizon. Obviously, for this week, next week, you're probably cutting orders. If the product is from overseas and takes two, three weeks to get, you're probably ordering things ahead of time. So purchasing releases orders, purchase orders, or actual orders to suppliers. Suppliers then ship raw and packaging materials, partially finished goods, finished goods into your manufacturing facility where any finishing or assembly or actually manufacturing has to be done to those raw and packed materials to create finished goods of higher value. That's your finished good inventory. You allocate the inventory to your various warehouses. Now notice these two major business processes, order taking and fulfillment and manufacturing are tethered by something we're calling forecasting. Forecasting is nothing more than predicting the future. We're trying to predict what we're going to sell next month. Usually if it's like right now, the month of January, we're, we've already, we're predicting what we're going to sell for February, March, April. Some companies have a three month rolling forecast, a horizon of forecasting three months in the future, others up to a year. Now, obviously, a, the 12th month of that forecast is not going to be as important or nearly as accurate as you want the first month of that forecast to be, but you're still predicting the future and you're still trying to guess what it is you're going to sell. And basically, a base statistical forecast is based on what you've sold in the immediate past and follows the seasonal patterns of previous years. So this whole thing is tethered by a forecast, which is can be good, which can be bad, but it's an Achilles heel in most operations planning because you're trying to predict the future, and of course we can't do that very well. Now the other thing to note is going from the trade, placing an order, order is processed, order is released, a forecast, a manufacturing plan, which is uh, transmitted to purchasing, which is then turned into a purchasing plan, which is submitted to suppliers, both in terms of plan and, and hard orders. That's all information, information flow, and it's all going in this direction. In the other direction here, you have actual physical goods. Suppliers providing raw pack assemblies, uh, partially finished goods or finished goods to manufacturing, which you maybe do a little bit more work or packaging to them or actual transformation of the raw and packed materials into finished goods, which you have at your manufacturing plant, and then you allocate them to your various warehouses or distribution centers, and then those goods stay there until they're distributed, picked for distribution to the trade. So that's really what we're trying to impact, the effective management of all this. We want order taking and fulfillment to be on time, complete for all orders that we get, which means you have to have the right products in the right place at the right time. That requires on as good a forecast as you can possibly get. We're trying to solve this big multi-criteria supply chain problem. Now, of course, it's very complicated. And the reason that we don't solve it just as a multi-criteria <clears throat> optimization problem is because we're trying to optimize four things. We're trying to keep costs down, inventory down, service and quality up. And we're looking at manufacturing lead times, transit times, production rates, production capacities, warehouse utilization, transportation equipment availability, demand volatility, 
and you're looking at this for every SKU you make, which are the I um, subscripts at each plant or supplier and how many plants and suppliers you have at the J and that, that the subscript J stands for those and you have K distribution centers. So if you have you know, 2,000 SKUs, you have uh, three, four factories or suppliers that make finished goods for you and you have five distribution centers, you can see how complicated all of this could get and the amount of data that you have to track. This just gives you perspective of the kind of problem and the complexity of what we're trying to do. So when we talk about sales and operations planning, we have an organization, we have standard operating procedures, the process itself, uh, the support to make everyone play nice, the data to drive it, the phases, which are the evolution and continuous improvement of that. So that's kind of our framework that you want to have before you even start. Then you want some execution plan and the KPIs, uh, key performance indicators, to know how you're doing. Basically, from the book by Wallace and Stahl, sales and operations planning is a five-step process. It works on a monthly drumbeat. So step one is gathering data. You do actually a demand plan, which is a base statistical forecast. Um, it's based on sales actuals, and statistical forecast. Then you do some supply planning and, and, and to create the demand plan you also want to meet with your marketing and salespeople to find out what numbers should go up and down based on new products being introduced, products being discontinued, um, knowledge that you have on your uh, competitors launching new products or discontinuing existing products and or your trade customers. Is Walmart opening up 10 stores? Is uh, another retailer closing stores. Uh, those will all affect your next month's production requirements. From there you move to su supply planning. Well, do we have the capacity to make it currently? Do we have the capacity if we're doing a 12-month rolling forecast? Are we running into any supply constraints and what do we want to do about it? You review the plan both from a demand and a supply standpoint. You set up a pre-meeting to go over all this and make sure everyone's on the same page. Everyone is in agreement with the number and the actions you're gonna propose that you take if there's any supply constraints, either short or longer term. Most of the time we're talking about midterm supply constraints with sales and operations planning. And then you have a meeting with the executive team. Um, and that meeting is for information to convey the demand plan to them uh, and have them help resolve any conflicts that may be there, um, be it in the demand planning side or the supply planning side. And then you go forward and execute that the following month and you repeat this every month. So let's look at the phases of the SNOP journey. Implementing sales and operations planning is a major business process. It's complicated. It runs on a monthly cycle, as we've discussed, and really a four-week drumbeat. It involves functions that are not known for cooperating and collaborating with each other. We're talking about supply chain or operations. We're talking about sales. We're talking about finance. We're talking about marketing and other activities. So it's a process, and the graphic here, it's a process, it's a process, it's a process. Change takes time. You have to know that going in. If you design this thing according to, you know, even get a consultant to help you or do it yourself and you read some stuff, you benchmark other companies, it's not going to operate at a high level when you flip the switch the first time. So it's very important to notice both. It's a process and it's complicated. If we look at the perspective from different parts of the organization, well, finance, what do they want to do? They have a financial budget. That's kind of their forecast for the whole year, and they want you to hit the budget all the time. Uh, C-level execs kind of agree with that, too, because that's what you've communicated to the street if you're a public corporation. Sales and marketing want to maximize revenue and market share, and they really want guaranteed product availability. If they've gone through the effort and made a sale and the supply chain can't deliver that product, 
um, they're not happy campers. They've already made the sale, then they've got to go out and sell that same volume again, either to the same customer or someone else. The supply chain wants a feasible plan. They want a bottom-up focus. They want to minimize risk and disruption. In fact, the supply chain would like to have like one SKU and just produce it all the time and have a predictable flat demand. Uh, that's not possible either. Uh, operations, same thing as the supply chain, really. They're looking at uh, want to do things for minimum cost, minimum changeovers. Uh, they want a, a forecast that's actually 100% uh, accurate so they make the right things so they can have the right things in the right place at the right time, etc. So you can see that everybody has different ways of looking at things. Uh, salespeople, marketing people are eternally optimistic. They always think that we're at the beginning of a dramatic increase in sales. And we know that's not realistic. They probably tend to overestimate, uh, if they make errors at all, on how promotions are, you know, the numbers for promotions. So here's three myths for sales and operations planning. It's over at go live when you flip the switch. It's a demand planning led effort and demand planning often reports to operations or supply chain. And myth number three is software will solve everything. The truth for myth one is it's just the beginning. You have to constantly be aware and close the socio-tech gaps. And we'll talk more about what that is. So go live is just the beginning. It's, it's a complex socio-technical process. It's replacing uh, a process that needs improvement and everyone knows it needs improvement, but that everyone was very used to operating within. It, the current process for most companies, if they don't have SNOP already, is probably a siloed functional process where there's finger pointing and bickering and um, the supply chain is responsible for the demand plan and uh, the sales have a plan and maybe they work together, maybe they don't, and if things don't work out, it's your fault you oversold, it's your fault you didn't produce what we sold, etc. Uh, SNOP will not work as expected coming out of the gate. It's a process that needs continuous improvement and refinement. So go live is just the beginning. Uh, you need a continuous improvement process built into it and you need key performance indicators that will help you track how you're doing. So you need operational KPIs. You need things such as, you know, that, that define your results. What's your demand plan accuracy? And let's face it, demand plans are less accurate than we like to believe. Um, a MAPE, uh, mean average percent error of 35 or 40% is probably a, a good threshold. If you can get 50%, you're probably dancing in the street. Anything higher, you're, you've got a really rational, predictable product. But most times, the demand volatility for the number of SKUs we sell is really high, and you'll, you'll not achieve that. Uh, you want to look at your inventory. Are you meeting your inventory objectives? And keeping your inventory is not growing out of hand it means that you're probably doing a good job. And, of course, customer service, on-time and complete deliveries, line fill, case fill, however you want to look at that. But secondly, things that most people do not track, and probably should, is participation KPIs. Is everybody that's supposed to be part of a meeting there? Are they prepared? So you want to, it's almost an attendance type thing. Uh, were you there? Were you prepared? And then take some climate surveys, occasionally, especially in the first year or two, on how they think SNOP is working and how it can be improved. You need this continuous improvement mindset and approach. Uh, you're changing from a well-entrenched silo-based legacy process to a monthly operating rhythm that requires cooperation of these functions that we talked about that don't necessarily always cooperate. The phases of it is uh, you're reacting, you're anticipating, you're collaborating, you're orchestrating. So you want to balance sales and operations planning. Uh, in stage one, uh, the goal uh, 
goals might be develop of an operational plan. Stage two, you might want to demand and supply matching uh, and, and increasing how that match works. Uh, stage three is going beyond that to profitability. And then stage four, which is demand sensing. I'm not even sure what that is because I've never seen a stage four company. Uh, conscious trade-offs for demand shaping to drive and optimize demand response. Uh, Cross-functional alignment obviously gets greater as you go across. So supply chain driven with other people contributing. Uh, stage two, supply chain driven for the purpose of achieving optimum forecast and supply. Uh, supply chain becomes SNOP orchestrator in stage three. And ownership uh, and the functions take ownership for input, output, and the results. And finally, it's a business ownership, which is the way that you do things. Process and technology. Stage one is probably an emerging process. You might even do it in Excel. Uh, stage two is a more formalized structure process. Um, maybe it's a one size fits all and the differentiations in the various details. Uh, tools are extended to include forecasting, supply chain planning, and inventory optimization. Stage three, you're talking about a process tailored to business model and needs. And again, stage four, which is again, stage three and four, I've not necessarily seen operating well. Our business becomes balanced, dynamic, and event-driven. Strong connection. Uh, we're one team. We're working together, etc. Uh, this is another, maybe a, a shorter uh, summary of the same thing we in a previous slide. Right. Last minute addition, stage four. Orchestration. The following must be included. Um, SKU management. How many, you know, you trim that tree. You don't just keep adding SKUs. You look at the numbers. You look at the disposition of the SKUs. You get rid of your dogs and cats, keep the stronger ones, and you're constantly managing that product offering. Uh, slob, which is slow and obsolete management. Um, if you don't do this well, uh, you glut your warehouse with product that are either slow, not moving very well, or obsolete. That's cholesterol in your warehouse system. It decreases the productive efficiency of your warehouse and it forces you to have to change the way you manufacture things because you don't have places to put your active product because 30% of your slots are filled with products that's not selling. So these things have to happen as well. Um, according to this study, which was done in 2013, and I'd like to see an update of it, 12% um, of the companies surveyed were in stage one, the larger percentage were in stage two, 45%. 12% were deemed to be in stage three and 28% in uh, stage four, which was 40%. So I would imagine this has changed to the point where we have the majority of the companies that are doing SNOP at a Fortune 500 level are probably in the 40% range, in the stage three and four range, excuse me. Myth number two, it's a demand planning-led effort. It is not a supply chain-led effort either. You can start that way, but it has to be a business-led project to succeed. And the executive team has to drive it. Myth number three, software will solve everything. Well, software does not solve everything when you don't have the good business processes already in place and people that understand how the new, improved business process will work and properly and properly execute it. Um, you have to have good data management. Then if you have good business processes, all the people are aware and properly executing it with good data management. So in other words, you're not putting garbage in, which means you get garbage out. Then software is a powerful enabler. But to think that software will solve all your problems is a myth. It's a long-term project. If you look at the graphic here, here's the stages in the, from the, one of the previous charts. And stage one is like crawling, maybe stage two is like walking. Then we're talking about stage three is running, stage four and five are sprinting. So you crawl, walk, run, soar. 
I guess you could skip the processes, but really from a developmental standpoint, you know, you shouldn't go from like being a, an immobile baby to just walking. Uh, there's a school of thought that says uh, crawling is developmental and it adds to your knowledge and solidifies behaviors in a certain way. So I would think the same is true here. It's, um, it doesn't matter how much management mandates it. You have to follow kind of this process. Well, you can shorten it, but you can't go from right from zero to soaring. I don't think it works that well. Even if you have company where the silos currently get along well, you might shorten the amount of time to get here, but it still takes time. It can take up to five years easily, maybe more to get to phase three. Example of where it is, um, where it is doing that, highly automated using ERP or other software. But there's examples where it's worked very well and the thing is done entirely in Excel. It's not software driven. Software is an enabler. Let's talk about the commitment required. Beyond stage two, traditional sales and operations planning is no longer sufficient and the process must be tailored to the specific needs of the organization. This is a key finding from a study done in 2010 by Gartner. I have to agree with that. Um, in most organizations, there was a compelling business event that precipitated, you know, that, that forced the company to implement SNOP. Usually it's a frustrated uh, executive team that says, I can't believe how inaccurate our forecasts are, how bad our customer service is, how poorly we managed inventory. And they hear or read about another company, maybe from a colleague of theirs, or something they've read that says sales and operations planning is a the solution, they bring it back into the company and say, we should probably do this. Once sales and operation planning process matures, it should no longer be owned by the supply chain, but by the business leaders. And it now becomes the legacy way in which people do work. But it's a huge change. And it's like a monthly process that you follow just ongoing. So it takes a long time to get it going. Um, it can build momentum as the leaders see the value of it, certainly, but it can also stumble early on because people don't want to play. And if their leaders are not insisting that they play and insisting and understand that participation is required, even when people don't want to participate in the beginning to make it develop and work, it will stumble and fail. Um, and it has stumbled and failed in a lot of companies. Where it has failed, they almost have to use another term if they launch it again because sales and operations planning term is tainted and so it has to be renamed or rebranded moving forward. You probably want to do some assessment of, of, of the maturity in order to build a roadmap to evolve through these stages. You want to have a clear executive-led business motive and common business metrics that transcend functional areas to break down the silos. And you want that to drive active participation and investment in the process. So it has to be executive-led. There has to be good business motives and clear metrics that will help make these functions operate in a way that they're probably not used to operating in the past. You want to have coaches and provide tools to help sustain the process and make change, manage the change. Software, again, might be a tool. It's not the end all. Uh, you want to make the process fit the nuances of the business, even though the, the basic framework of the process, the steps from the uh, Stahl and Wallace book that we looked at earlier are still there and that's what you'll be using. Um, you might want to consider a multi-tier approach to cater to different planning horizons and business models. If your products aren't homogeneous across your business units, uh, they may have different planning horizons and sometimes that planning horizon is defined by your customer. I think Walmart looks for 18-month rolling forecasts from their suppliers. 
Uh, so guess what? You better have 18 months rolling forecast to prevent, present to Walmart every month. So if you have to do that for Walmart and they're 30% of your business, well, you're probably going to do an 18-month rolling forecast for everything, even though you're not going to supply it to them, uh, to that extreme. And you want the right balance between process improvement and enabling technologies. Remember, this is a, a process that's both human and technology led. Okay, so here's some of the single largest challenges from the um, from a supply chain insights uh, survey that they did in April, May of 2013. Understanding and support from the executive team. That was like the highest part. And it didn't matter if it's a discrete business or a process business. Discrete businesses we make um, I don't know, what do we make? We make things, we make widgets, individual widgets. Uh, uh, processes where you have a continuous flow like oil refinery or something of that nature. Uh, technologies that support the process, that was a single challenge. Execution of the SNOP plan is next. The role of finance in the budget is a smaller. Clarity of supply chain strategy and supply chain excellence then. Availability of skilled resources follows that. So clearly, understanding the support from the executive team is the number one thing. We'll talk about that more later. Well, right now, actually. As Kara Ishikawa, one of my favorite uh, quality control gurus, said, if there's no leadership from the top, stop promoting TQC. It's from his 1985 book, What is Total Quality Control? That was the single biggest impact of that book. And there was lots of big impacts in that book in my life and my career. But if there's no leadership from the top, stop it. If there's no leadership from the top that has an appetite to do SNOP, you're not going to succeed. Same thing. Forget about it. It's almost a cliche. Nothing that's complicated and nothing that involves significant organizational change, cross-functional work, and buy-in will work without executive team leadership. Not quality, not new product development, not implementing an ERP system like SAP or Oracle, and of course, SNOP. Management's role. The executive team has to know their role and the importance of their role, the critical importance of their role. As soon as people see the executive team not having an executive meeting, not following up on the actions or the KPIs and SOP in general, um, not being upset if their people are not participating in the meetings or actually drawing, you know, taking them out of the meetings to do something they deem more important, SOP will begin to die and it dies very quickly. And it will begin to die no matter what the practitioners do. So you need an SNOP quarterback and a middle linebacker both. You need a Tom Brady and you need uh, a tenacious linebacker. Uh, you need a dynamic leader who can make it go, is detail-oriented, process-driven. Oftentimes someone that's good at this becomes a lifer in this role. They can be skilled and deft at uh, moving around the organization and being intricate, but they can also be tenacious in busting down walls and, or in this case, busting down silos. This is a unique person that you task with this at the very front end. And if they're good at it, like I said, they probably become a lifer in this role. So here's some references uh, to sum up this presentation. Uh, sales and operations planning maturity, what does it take to get and stay there? Sales and operations planning, the State of the Union, which was uh, a Laura Ciceri, uh Supply Chain Insight report. And if you go to her website, Supply Chain Insights, she is kind of like the SNOP guru. And I had another presentation that I gave uh closing the gap between people and processes. I talk about the socioeconomic aspects of making sure that people and the process get aligned and how to do that. So there's more information you can find out. If you, for some reason, other than have to write a paper in a class that I'm teaching, need help on this, I'm happy to do it. Here's my contact informa information. And I will still, uh, still do consulting. 
And if you have any questions, please uh, bring it up to me in class or send me uh, an email or text to the phone number and email address here. Thanks a lot for your attention, and I hope you gain some insight from this presentation. Thank you very much.